Hello, this is the American Medical Association's COVID-19 update. Today, we're discussing the latest trends and research on COVID-19 with Dr. Howard Bachner from his vantage point as editor-in-chief of JAMA and the JAMA Network in Chicago. Uh, Dr. Bachner prefers that I address him as Howard. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's chief experience officer in Chicago. Howard, we're seeing a real surge in daily cases across the nation, uh, but we've also had some good news on the vaccine front. Uh, what does it all mean and is the end in sight? Let's start with uh, vaccines. Yeah, I think there's a number of trends. I'm sure we'll get to them over time. Obviously, the announcements from Moderna and Pfizer about these messenger RNA vaccines are indeed exciting. I, I would say, um, as a journal editor, as a, a physician, um, people want to see the data. Uh, I mean, we've seen many of these announcements um, and then uh, people, when they are, are able to consume all of the data, uh, it, it, it's uh, somewhat less positive than some of these announcements. That, that the effectiveness of the two vaccines is similar is encouraging because they use the same platforms. This kind of messenger RNA enters the cell, um, leads to the development of kind of the spike protein that the, the body makes a uh, uh, immunologic response, and then when it sees a live spike uh, protein, it can react to it. That's the protective nature of it. I think um, there was more data from Pfizer this morning about it working throughout uh, different age groups, particularly the elderly. But I, I think many people really want to understand the safety data, and that has not been part of either of the two announcements. When, when do you think we'll get a look at that? Well, Pfizer announced this morning that they're going to try to file for an emergency use authorization sometime in the next few days. Now, I do want to point out that um, not Pfizer, but one uh, one or two of the other companies have said they, they will get an EUA in the coming months. They uh, should not say that. That's not their decision about whether they get an EUA. That is up to the Food and Drug Administration. And I really want to applaud Steve Hahn, who as commissioner has been very clear about the process that the FDA will go through. So companies can apply for an EUA, but that doesn't necessarily, they'll be awarded an EUA. And there will be some additional checks and balances that have already been announced. Um, so for example, it appears as though the FDA will share the data uh, with uh, a, an advisory panel. And then that advisory panel, indeed, I don't know if they'll have a formal vote, but indeed will make a recommendation to the FDA, although the FDA obviously will make the final decision. I think because of many of the issues that have transpired over the last couple weeks to months, I, I do not believe the executive branch or the Secretary of Health and Human, Sec uh, Health and Human Services will interfere with the process. I think everyone recognizes if they did, that would really undercut anyone's trust in the approval process. So I, I have a lot of faith that it will be well handled by the FDA, the FDA advisory panel. And then of course, the advisory committee on immunization practices will make their own recommendations. And then some states have announced that they too will look at the data before they distribute the vaccine. That, that, that's given me some pause. I'm, I'm not sure how many groups we want looking at the same data. But I, I do think there will be many checks and balances. You, uh, you mentioned the word distribution. Obviously, there's a big job ahead of us, even you know, once we get to the approval process. Any sense about the timeline and what the next few months will look like? Well, I, I do think if an EUA is filed in the next week or so, and let's say it takes the uh, FDA and the FDA advisory panel a couple more weeks, that, that probably brings us into mid-December, maybe late December maybe as late as January 1. Um, the first 20 million doses or so are likely to go to healthcare workers. Um, and those, those doses are likely to be distributed through hospitals. I, I think most people are guardedly optimistic that the first phase of distribution will go well. Um, Procurement of supplies by hospitals is done every day. There's 35 or 3,600 acute hospital facilities in the U.S. So I, I think regardless of uh, the temperature at which the vaccine needs to be stored, um, the first 20 million doses, because they're going to healthcare workers, it will roll out genuinely, generally smoothly. 
and then hospitals are going to have to make decisions about who gets it within within their their environment and whether or not will, that will then be extended to nursing homes, skilled nursing homes, and elderly residents of those nursing homes. That's the first 20 million. It's the next 50 or 100 million that people are really concerned about. Once you leave the hospital environment, um, vaccine distribution through practices is far more complicated. Storage is more complicated for some of the vaccines. It's two doses, so people have to be called back. You're going to have to track who gets which dose and when because you're going to have to follow patients um, for uh, potential side effects. So I have a lot of confidence in phase one healthcare workers. I think everyone is much more concerned about the next 100 million people. Well, uh, while we wait for vaccine approval and widespread distribution, can you talk about uh, what you're seeing on the research front in terms of therapies? Are we seeing you know, any movement there in terms of viable options for physicians to prevent uh, COVID from regressing and keep patients out of the hospital? Yeah, so, some good news. Uh, I'd like to go over some, um, some really good news because I, I think most of what we hear is so dire. Um, the numbers are... Are, are concerning. I, I've described them as frightening, 150,000 cases plus. I, In all my conversations with people, I don't think anyone anticipated this number of cases in uh, early November. And this is without flu. And people know there's been this concern about influenza. It's not simply the number of cases, because that does likely reflect additional testing. It's the number of patients in the hospital. And over the last few days, that's been 65 to 70,000. And I think you've, you've seen across the country, particularly in the Midwest and certain areas in the South, uh, hospitals beginning to say uh, there's both a supply issue as well as a, a, a bed issue. That's the concerning news. The good news, though, is that mortality has definitely come down. We Some data has crossed my desk. For patients who are hospitalized, not, not intubated, not intubated. Mortality is probably now substantially under 10%. And so that is really encouraging news. So I think many more people who are ill but not intubated are surviving. I think for those intubated, it still remains relatively high at 35 or 40%. But I do think we've made substantial gains in, in treatment. Prevention is a different issue. I think people have awaited the monoclonal antibodies. Um, uh, Lilly uh, has announced and has published one study, uh, an early phase two study that's encouraging, but I think not nearly as definitive as people had hoped. Uh, in part, the numbers are very small, uh, four or 500 uh, patients treated with different doses of the monoclonal antibody. Viral titers came down, some clinical improvement, but the real issue is, does it prevent progression? Last week, JAMA published a very provocative paper, Hypothesis Generating. It was a randomized clinical trial about the use of a particular type of antidepressants in uh, preventing progress to more serious disease from people who had mild disease. So I think at this point, um, that study and monoclonal antibodies um, are providing the best promise for prevention from mild disease to serious disease, although clearly the study in, in JAMA was preliminary. Mm. That's really interesting news. Um, you know, before we started our segment today, we were talking about our respective holiday plans. That's something on yeah. everybody's minds right now. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, there are lots yeah. of warnings about getting together. You know, what research are you seeing that would uh, help inform what people are planning for the holidays? Yeah, there were some announcements uh, about 10 days ago or two weeks ago that people had thought that um, the surge was being fueled by law, by small groups. I, I think now people have looked at additional data and are less clear about that. It's, it's clearly contributing. Um, the story continues to uh, evolve. But I, I, I was struck, you know, a couple weeks ago, I had a chance once again to talk with Dr. Fauci. And I asked Tony, you know, can we talk about Thanksgiving and Christmas? And he, he once again was pre -ashen. He said, uh, Howard, let's just get through Thanksgiving before we even talk about Christmas. It was really interesting. And, and he said, uh, and this was three weeks ago, small numbers, small numbers, small numbers. Then the numbers exploded. 
And then there was data that through some tracking and tracing, there was concern that uh, small groups were contributing to the additional numbers. Um, I think people are really changing their Thanksgiving plans. Uh, you know, I spoke to the senior staff at JAMA yesterday, and I think everyone's going to keep the numbers in low single digits, four, five, six people. For me, I, I mentioned I usually go to my brother's house and there's 20 or 25 people. This year, it's just my own house, my uh, two two children, my sister-in-law, my, my daughter-in-law, so it'll only be six people. So I think people have really change their plans. I think some of it will uh, depend uh, upon what local public health officials say, and I'd really ask people to listen carefully. You know, you know, in the Midwest, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, Michigan, there's been a huge explosion, and I think public health um, uh, folks there have really asked people to keep, keep, keep Thanksgiving to small numbers. I think the CDC put out some information yesterday, small numbers, open windows. I think that may depend on where you live, um, you know, possibly have it outside, um, be careful about utensils. So I do I do think people have really changed their plans. Mm -hmm. Could get a little chilly here uh, in yeah. Chicago. Yes. Um, well, uh, given your background uh, is as a pediatrician, I'm interested in your perspective on uh, you know, information that suggests uh, emergency department visits have dramatically increased for mental health issues in school age kids and adolescents compared to last year. How, do you do you think we understand the toll that this pandemic and remote learning is taking on on children and teens? Yeah, um, you, you know, some, in some regards, people often say that children are resilient and 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 they'll manage. You, you know, we often. S s uh, have different uh, views about children, uh, how, how much emotional or intellectual struggles they could have because of the pandemic. On the other hand, we'll often say that they're quite resilient. Um, firstly, I'd be very careful about putting them in one group. Uh, you know, children, uh, you know, birth, to 20 years old, it really may be very different for the five, six, seven year old versus the 15 or 16 year old. It obviously is going to depend upon what resources a family can provide or a school system can provide. I think there's been increasing concern that for children who are really struggling educationally, Zoom really only enhances that struggle. For other children, they may be doing fine. So I think it really is going to vary from individual to individual family to family, um, I'm guardedly optimistic that all of the news that I've heard is that in the fall of 2021, if we begin to think about it now with uh, immunizations coming to a wider and wider number of people, that we will definitely begin to get people back to college in person, back to schools in person for all of next year. I know this year it's just really varied tremendously around the country. Um, the toll, I think we don't quite know yet. JAMA, interestingly enough, has an article coming out in a week or two about the resiliency amongst the elderly, which is very different than what people have talked about. Now, these are community dwelling elderly, and there's four or five small surveys that have suggested they have done far better than people had anticipated. Well, that's nice news. Well, getting to that kind of vision of the fall, a very positive uh, possible future requires that, of course, people do get vaccinated. And one yeah. obstacle to that is just the continuing amount of misinformation that we're seeing on the vaccine front. Uh, you know, how do you view your role and, and JAMA's role in the months ahead to combat that? Yeah, we, we've uh, uh, just published uh, next week, we'll publish another five or six articles on, on the vaccine approval process, um, what people need to be aware of, common questions that they ask. Um, a number, Kevin Volpe's group from Penn is going to, we're going to publish a paper about kind of behavioral approaches to trying to make uh, people understand uh, about the vaccines. I, I think ultimately, we really will be reliant on the data that's made available to the public and then interpreted by their local clinician, physician, or at the national level, you know, folks like Dr. Fauci get on TV and talk about the data. I, I do think people 
are very nervous about the side effects. I, I think they'll be trusting about the effectiveness, although the numbers will be small, you know, 90% uh, effective when there's been 90 cases. I think the public needs to understand how do we come up with that estimate. I, I think what will really make a difference around the vaccination rates is what people know about the safety. What, what are they told about the safety? What do they understand about the safety? I think people do want their lives to return to normal, and they know one of the ways to, for, for that to happen is to be vaccinated. But I, I think more of this is going to turn on the safety rather than on the effectiveness. Mm -hmm. I, I think once you're above 70 or 80 or 90 percent, people will go, oh, that's effective. But tell me, is it is it safe? And there they it's going to be complicated. These are new vaccines. I think when you say messenger RNA or DNA, it makes people nervous without understanding exactly how it's being used in the in, in the vaccine. And I think we need uh, the scientific community needs to be humble and to say, look, we have safety data out for, you know, two months or four months or six months. We think it will be safe for a lifetime, but we can't be 100 percent sure. Well, thank you, Howard, so much for uh, sharing your perspective and for all the work that you and the team at JAMA are doing to keep the focus on science and data uh, so that we can move back uh, to that time of being normal again. Uh, that's it for today's COVID-19 update. We'll be back soon with another segment. Uh, if you'd look, uh, like more information on COVID-19, visit ama-assn.org slash COVID-19. Thanks for joining us. Please take care. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Uh, Make sure it's safe and with small numbers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.